Today's video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Remember when I said I'd do Hill House in my Bly Manor video and it's been like 10 months? And in my waiting, an entirely new Mike Flanagan show was released, Midnight Mass. And this is the first of his Netflix shows that isn't based on classical literature. It's a religious supernatural horror that falls tonally somewhere in between Hill House and Bly Manor in its execution. It doesn't get as heart-wrenching in the romantic tragedy sense that Bly does, and it's not as overtly frightening as Hill House, but it's probably gonna terrorize some people to their core based on the subject matter. The same way aspects of Bly Manor cut me to my core. Kinda wish I could just talk about Bly again. And while this is his first fully original creation, in some ways it is actually still based on classic literature. Because it's technically based on one of the most classic pieces of literature there is. The Bible. And for as many people out there that find peace in religion, there are just as many others out there that have it as their central form of torment. Though there were Easter eggs and other things that Mike Flanagan has made. Midnight Mass is a book written by Kate Siegel's character in Hush, which also featured Samantha Sloyan. The book was featured again in Gerald's Game, and he apparently wanted it in Hill House, but the shipment went missing before filming. Mike Flanagan is someone who grew up in the Catholic faith and used that as his foundation for this horror story, not something new or unique, but I haven't seen the concept explored quite in this way. Apparently he pitched it all the way back in 2014 uh, and no one wanted it, but with two hit shows under his belt, Netflix was like, yeah, yeah, why not? And I'm glad they did. I personally prefer both Bly Manor and Hill House to this, but the show still has a lot to love and be compelled by. My main issue with it is that the monologuing that Flanagan tends to have an affinity for is a bit overdone here in a lot of episodes. Some of those conversations were necessary and just needed to be tightened up, but others were things that just could have been confused conveyed faster in other places or just completely omitted. And because of that, I feel like the show could have been five or six really strong episodes instead of seven, but it was still an enjoyable watch. I will say there are a couple of heavy things in here and topics that people might be a little bit sensitive to. So if you find yourself sensitive to things involving animals or pregnancy, maybe just take a quick look into that. But let's hop into the story being wove. Spoilers abound, obviously. So each episode is named after something biblical. So we start off with book one, Genesis, uh, the birth of it all and the original sin. And it starts not with a mass, but with a crash. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself, but uh, basically it, it sets the tone of the show with a car accident. Lights flashing, paramedics desperately trying to save this young girl while Riley here is drunk, quivering on the sidewalk, praying. Ask him why he always takes the kids. Well, the drunk fucks walk away with scratches. And I guess that was a personal fear that Flanagan had for himself that he's exploring through Riley, who goes to prison and every night he's haunted by the girl he killed's face, flashing like the emergency lights surrounding the crash. Four years later, he's out and headed to live with his parents on Crockett Island, a fictional town somewhere off Maine, home to a measly 127 people with boats being their only way to the mainland. This is where Riley used to be the prodigal son, the perfect altar boy, and now he's committed this act that's completely killed any kind of faith he ever had. So the roles have kind of been reversed where the girl he loved as a teen who was the heathen runaway, Aaron has also recently returned pregnant and attends church weekly, redeemed. They both went through different life-changing experiences that resulted in vastly different spiritual outcomes. One where Riley is still haunted every night, never seeing the sunrise. But while Riley's younger brother and his friends are waiting for their local pot hookup, someone brings this massive old chest off the ferry and once it's safely concealed, it knocks back. Ooh, spooky. So the whole plot basically centers on religion and pretty much anybody who attends church here attends the Catholic church, which causes some tension with the sheriff who is Muslim and played by Rahul Kohli. And it's like a small town, you get small town judgments and even the people who don't attend church make comments or jokes. Later, Sharif. I know a lot of people were really excited to see a more modern representation of a practicing Muslim, especially where it wasn't something that made up their entire character. And I think they did a great job with him. But the faith present on the island is static. They've had the same priest for decades Decades, even though everyone comments that he's losing it from dementia, but they still just guide him through the motions of sermon. And for some reason, they thought it would be a good idea to send him on a pilgrimage where he seemingly gets lost in the desert, which is where we meet Beverly Keene, the holier than thouest of them all, and she's terrible. But instead of the priest Monsignor Pruitt returning, a younger priest named Father Paul Hill, the one with the knocking chest, says that he was sent as a temporary replacement while they deal with Pruitt's very serious medical issues. But whatever he brought with him seems to be sinister. While the kids are smoking their pot, something is killing and draining the blood from stray cats on the island. Joe, the town drunk, thinks he hallucinated or had a nightmare about being chased by a giant albatross and then was trying to break into a store. And things keep getting weird when the storm 
storm rolls in and Riley is positive that he is seeing the old priest Pruitt stumbling around on the beach before he disappears into the storm. So pretty typical for a Flanagan horror, we have character trauma at the forefront with something sinister brewing underneath. And sinister it is because dozens of dead cats that have been drained of blood wash up on the beach. So that is pretty much the setup for our story, which brings us to book two, Psalms. And Psalms are uh, religious scriptures in the form of sacred songs and hymns. They apparently had a major effect on Christian worship and the way in which it's done, which may seem a little bit absent at the beginning of this episode when they're walking up the beach with dozens of dead cats with massacred necks. But nothing stops the Lord, so they continue their plans for Ash Wednesday celebrations, which is where a major content warning occurs. Bev, who's claiming to use the poison to ward off whatever killed all the cats, actually uses it to poison Joe's dog. I'm telling you, Sheriff, it's a menace. Who then dies very graphically, so if you're looking to avoid that, like I definitely would have liked to, I would just skip through the potluck scene altogether. And this bitch immediately tries to cover her tracks and says that if it was her poison, it was an accident, but there's no way you could prove it was her poison. But Joe knows it wasn't a mistake, that it was likely to specifically cause him pain because he accidentally shot Lisa, which is why she's in a wheelchair. How holy of Bev to kill an innocent animal. The only other detail here that you might want to catch is that the doctor, who is gay, says that the new priest looks at her the same way Pruitt did and she always assumed it was in some kind of judgment. And that's why I felt fully confident in saying that Father Hill is in fact Monsignor Pruitt, but younger. Further confirmed when the doctor's mother, who admittedly has dementia, sees Father Hill for the first time and immediately thinks that it's Pruitt because they were the same age and would have known each other when they were younger. So some miracle has brought him back to his youth. And the miracles keep coming. At mass, when Father Hill is offering communion, he basically pulls out the biggest trick in the evangelical handbook, faith healing. It, it's not funny. I... Lisa. <gasps> And by golly, it works. But while these miracles are happening, whatever is killing all the cats just upgraded to the local pot dude. And it wasn't because he was a dealer and something's trying to eradicate sinners. It was literally just wrong place, wrong time. Bringing us to book three, Proverbs. So Proverbs are short, insightful sayings. In the Bible, they tend to address ethics and unexpected behavior, the meaning of human life. And apparently they were almost left out of the Bible because a lot of them contradict each other. And contradictions of actions, beliefs, and interpretation of scripture is the central theme to this story. So it cuts back to Lisa walking, but the priest instantly looks unwell and starts coughing up blood, which I took as him getting weak for performing miracles and he has to feed or be fed to sustain it, but not quite. This is also where Bev realizes that he's Pruitt because she notices the newspaper clipping on the wall that were shown in a later episode. Either way, the town starts handing out miracle pamphlets like the days of old and the church is suddenly packed. Like they literally just watched a girl who'd been paralyzed for most of her life start walking again. I get it, they're gonna become militant followers. And this obviously starts creating some conflict with the non-religious or the non-Catholic. The sheriff in particular has issues with Bev trying to teach scripture in public school as do other parents. And he wants to stress to his son that miracles don't work this way. God doesn't work this way. Healing doesn't work this way. But other attendees are starting to notice the positive effects as well. People don't need glasses. They're looking younger. They're regaining mental clarity. But then Pruitt collapses off the stage and the doctor says he seems to be fighting off a virus. But there's no rest for the wicked and he is very eager to talk to Riley. So he offers to make an AA chapter there so he wouldn't have to travel to the mainland for meetings. Which if Riley used to be the star altar boy, it would make sense if this was Pruitt and wanted that connection with him. And because Lisa can now walk, she decides to offer Joe forgiveness, even though she's still very angry. You stole from me things I didn't even have yet. If God can forgive you, and he says he can, then I can forgive you. <sighs> and that enraged forgiveness motivates him to give up alcohol and attend the meetings too. But as the rest of the town is prospering, the father is literally at his lowest. He keels over and dies, then almost immediately pops back to life. So while this episode has been weaving, we were shown the story of what happened to Pruitt while he was on his pilgrimage in the form of a confession. He wandered out into the desert in confusion, got caught up in a sandstorm before stumbling into a cave where a winged creature attacked him to feed on his blood, then fed him his blood in return when he started started reading scripture. And he's convinced himself that this is an angel because anytime angels appear in the Bible, people are afraid and he was afraid, but it's now gifted him with youth and everlasting life. But I think that's what the rest of us would like to call 
a vampire. An ancient one at that. The word vampire is actually never spoken in the show at all, but Flanagan specifically said that when he was a kid, he asked a question about communion, that if they're eating the body and drinking the blood of Christ to stay alive, doesn't that make them vampires? And I think whatever this creature is realized that he could use him to find some kind of better life and food source than just waiting for animals and travelers to stumble into this tomb. There's no mention of vampires specifically in the Bible, but Proverbs, this episode's namesake, does mention some kind of flying blood-sucking monster. Forgive me, Lord, for the small lies I must tell in your service literally doing everything in his power to fit the scripture to this monster and the blood he's tricking people into drinking. I'll talk a little bit later as to my theories on how he died, but moving on. But that brings us to book four, Lamentations, which is all about the destruction of Jerusalem and the desertion of God, but also passionate expressions of grief and sorrow. Bright topics, which is an unfortunate title for the prospects of what's to come and what he's done when the episode starts with the doctor not being able to hear Aaron's baby anymore. She had no symptoms of a miscarriage carriage, nothing changed, she's just suddenly not pregnant. And this is really hard for her in a lot of ways, one of which is that she felt the baby saved her life. It helped get her out of an abusive relationship. She and Riley start to talk about what they think is going to happen when they die. Riley talks about falling apart to the atoms, becoming a part of something so much bigger than the horror he committed. And Aaron talks of the heaven she'll reach some day to meet her unborn daughter. This is one of those really big like back and forth character monologues, but I feel like it mostly worked here. Back at the father's house, Sturge, the mayor and his wife are a little bit creeped out by everything happening with this de-aging and rebirth of Pruitt. But Bev is instantly all up on the miracle train. Tries to bring him food and even though he's starving, he can't eat it and he's suddenly very sensitive to the sunlight. Vampire! He says he can feel God move inside him, but I'm pretty sure that's the vampiric pull to feed. But Bev doesn't question the miracle, she just wants him to spread the gospel. Which I think is already spreading. The doctor's mom has progressively been getting better, but her blood samples burn in the sunlight. So it's gotta be the sacrament. He's been feeding them vampire blood. He even desperately sucks back what's left in the bottle after feeding on his own blood out of desperation while frantically praying these urges away. Which cuts to Joe making those same pleas in the grocery store or praying against the temptation of alcohol. So he of course goes to find who he believes is Father Hill and mentions that it looks like he could have been Pruitt's son, which funny enough, there were rumors that he might have had a little thing with someone back in the day. And considering the way that he always looks at Sarah and how the mom recognized him, I think Mr. Pruitt here is the doctor's real dad. The two get into a scuffle, Joe hits his head and the good father starts treating him like a blood pop. And Bev just doesn't care. Not even when his flesh burns in the sun, she finds a way to make the scripture fit. Everyone else has questions though, but she won't have it. What the hell did you do? The man who acts presumptuously, that man shall die. Saying that because Joe was maimer of children and gift to no one, God was just calling him home. And that if they're happy to accept Lisa's miracle, they have to accept this side as well. Do not cherry pick the glories of God. Because Pruitt doesn't feel guilt, it must be God's work. But usually a lack of guilt and empathy when you kill someone isn't really a holy sentiment. And to really drive home the point that the sacrament clearly seems to have something to do with the vampire blood, Aaron's tests on the mainland come back that there was no evidence that she was ever pregnant at all based on her hormone levels. And if you were consuming something that was rapidly healing your body, it would absolutely register a fetus as an intruder. Now, a big question around all of this is how did Pruitt die? It looked similar to the poisoning, but he had like a full seizure before it happened and was slowly deteriorating over time. I know a lot of people think that Bev poisoned him to like speed along some kind of process, but he was coughing up blood before she realized he was Pruitt. So either he was poisoning himself slowly to complete the transformation, or what I think is more likely is that the more you consume the vampire blood, it'll start irreparably changing your system, leading to your death and full transformation. But it's AA time and this shot of Pruitt looking at Riley from a distance literally looks like a movie monster of old. I love it. And here's the lie that kind of condemns Riley. Pruitt says that Joe won't be joining them because he's visiting his sister on the mainland, but Riley knows that's a lie because Joe just told him she had died which he can't get out of his head, so on his way back to Aaron, he stops by to ask him about it. Where the father is already freaking out again from hunger, even though he just drained Joe like a go-gurt. Which is when our resident vampire demon returns. Dressed in Pruitt's old clothing, which is definitely what Riley saw stumbling around in the storm, and probably what Joe thought he saw too. And it pours its blood into the sacrament bottle, which Pruitt managed to convince himself is the actual sacrament of the Lord, and feeds it to the people. Never seeing an issue with condemning people to that hunger. Which is when Riley walks in, and it's 
all over. Or it would have been if he hadn't consumed the blessing at church. Bring us to Book 5 Gospels, which were all about the life and ministry of Jesus and tend to stand for good news. Which is pretty obviously about the good news Prude is about to bring to the people. Like how incredible Mildred looks now. She's younger, healthier, mentally sound, but it's tainted. And the title of the show finally comes into play because the father obviously can't come out during the day. They have to hold midnight masses. I feel the sun would set before midnight, but this just rolls off the tongue better. And it seems fitting. This first midnight mass is on Good Friday. And he starts by saying that Jesus's suffering was good, that it was the cost to his eternal life, which is his justification for the pain he endured at the hands of this monster in exchange for his perceived blessing. And as God's will changes, so does morality. Mildred's freaked out, but Bev's like, yes, God's warriors to kill the wicked homosexuals. It's literally just him trying to justify what he did to Joe and what he knows he'll have to continue doing. That God is working through him to create new morality with an army in his name. So they're gonna turn everyone into vampires, pretty sure. Which is when Riley pops back up to explain to Aaron what happened to him. He wakes up to the priest saying that death is no longer part of God's plan, but he burns in the sunlight. And then learns that Father Paul is actually Pruitt. How do you know that story? Who are you? You know who I am. Riley's not really on board with his holy mission or the way that Pruitt justifies murdering Joe as the Lord calling him home. Look, there's a lot of ways to call someone home without sucking out their blood like a juice box. It's hard to justify that this is God's plan when anyone with a pulse can put them into a frenzy. I wouldn't be surprised if God did want Bev out of the equation. <laughs> but if you believe that the Lord is working through you with those urges, why would you deny any of them? How much more then will the blood of Christ cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death. Beth is super eager to twist that gospel into its most literal interpretation. That the flesh and the blood of Jesus, the sacrament, rises people on the final day for eternal life. But that's not Jesus. And the burning flesh stuff is in Revelation. An angel pouring his bowl on the sun that then scorched men with fire. And then that fifth bowl will plunge the world into darkness, which won't be an issue for the blessed. So what I'm hearing is that the Bible is actually making way for vampires to inherit the earth. I love you, baby. I'm sorry. Bev's like, you little shit, God is blessing you. Now drink that blood. Accept it with serenity and grace. That's not very serene. Literally just flipping one addiction for another. But Pruitt sees Riley as the bearer of good news, that his redemption will be inspiration, but Bev's not so sure. But if he tells people. What of it? How else does gospel spread? And honestly, vampire eyes rock. The glow, the flames in the ocean, the cosmos in the sky, I'd be tempted. But it cuts back to the boat, where he apologizes for what Aaron's about to see, but he needed her to believe him so that she can save herself. I love you, Aaron Green. I did my best. And the last thing he sees is the girl that he killed. She's not broken, not dead, just as she should be. And he grabs her hand as he finally gets his sunrise. Which cuts to horrific screaming as Aaron watches him burn to ash. <laughs> Holy shit, as if she needed more trauma for one week. Great scene though. Bringing us to book six, Acts of the Apostles, where Bev is now convinced that Riley is essentially Judas, that he may have poisoned the well before denying his blessing, so they need to share everything they have at the Easter village so people don't ruin the miracle. The apostles were those who spread the gospel of the Lord, which is essentially what all these townspeople will be doing. And in one sense, Bev was right. Aaron goes right to the doctor to tell her the story, and she doesn't think Aaron's insane because all her blood samples have been sparking up in the sunlight. And other than Aaron, Riley also left letters for his family, but he also left one for Pruitt. Remember, we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Basically saying, you're not special, this isn't God's plan, and you're just gonna burn to ash like I did. And Sarah, being a doctor who believes a disease is being spread at the church, goes to ask the sheriff to investigate, and he's like, you have no proof, and you want me, the Muslim, to investigate a church where people believe that miracles are happening. 
fair. And this is where we get a monologue that I feel like the substance is important, but I wish it had been revealed naturally rather than as an information dump in this one moment. Like, yes, please give him a rich character background, but like, we've been through this with the Jamie situation in Bly Manor, don't just dump it. I love reading Coley talk about the role. It's basically like Flanagan took the ideal American hero and mixed it with the post 9-11 villain and then made that the sheriff. So Sarah decides to take the samples to be tested on the mainland. But the ferry's not there and Serge is repairing all the other boats on the dock, preventing anyone from leaving the island. Then they start cutting the power and disabling the cell tower. And if the sheriff wasn't struggling enough, his son doesn't pray with them anymore and wants to go to the Easter vigil because the church is promising to share the miracle with everyone who attends and insists on going. Which is when Pruitt reveals the truth of who he is, says that he has a way to stop death, but that like Jesus, they all need to make that same sacrifice. Sounding very Jonestown here, and yeah, look at all that poison. They're not even trying to mix it with flavored drink. And to demonstrate this sacrifice they'll all have to make, Sturge is the first of the new disciples to suck back some poison. And of course, everyone is horrified. And instead of, I don't know, arresting anybody, the sheriff just gets up to leave with Ollie. But then there's the angel. Sheriff, please. I Ooh, that sound cue, that ain't holy. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and they were afraid. I don't know, if I was that devout and saw scaled wings, uh, angel is the last thing I'd be thinking. But Sturge pops back up, and the church tunes start playing, and they start handing out the poison. They have to let their mortal bodies die so the divine body can awaken. So the sheriff gets held down on the ground to watch his son end his life. No, I choose God. Holy shit, did Pure Flicks get a hand on this show? And people are just so quick to accept this with no further information foaming up blood left and right. So Millie, to try to stop things, shoots Pruitt in the head, but obviously he's gonna heal. This just gives Bev control over the situation. And the situation is a feeding frenzy. Don't <laughs> It's a nightmare. There's not a damn thing holy about this. Parents draining their children, people being massacred. I don't know why they didn't just smash through the window, but the group manages to get out back where Bev, the fucking coward, is also hiding. I mean, you could shoot me right now. It just mean I'm five minutes behind. <gasps> yes, like she's coming back, but for right now, Yes! Gotta admit though, those vampire eyes are pretty spectacular though. And she tells Sturge to unlock the doors. Even though Pruitt specifically said he wanted them all to stay locked in so they could be oriented, not just roaming around feasting on people. But that's exactly what Bev wants. Anyone who didn't attend church deserves to suffer. Just as the gates are always open. How else does the gospel spread? It's the same thing Pruitt said about Riley that she's just throwing back at the situation. Which brings us to book seven, Revelations. Which of course is all about the end times, war, famine, pestilence, and death. And that seems to be in full effect as the blessed are ripping people from their homes. Ollie finally realizing that maybe this wasn't God's intention, but it's too late. So the reigning humans realize that the ultimate plan is to get to the mainland to spread this. So they set all the boats on fire and send Warren and Lisa to go find his canoe so they can escape the island. Which is one something I've been thinking about like the entire time it gets brought up. The idea that all these people believe that a heaven is waiting for them, but that even with that belief, they all claw and fight and beg for any extra time they can at the end. Divine bodies are supposed to be what you get in heaven. Why would you be preventing yourself from entering that kingdom you believe in so strongly? And it's Bev that you see it from the most. Because it's probably not God that Bev truly loves. It's feeling better than everyone and having power. So Riley's mom doles her out some truth. Bev, I want you to listen to me. You aren't a good person. Wow. <gasps> That was uncalled for. Tells her that God doesn't love her more than he loves anyone else, that God loves her son who killed someone just as much as he loves her. Then stabs herself in the neck to give everyone a chance to escape. Yeah, that's some real divine action right there, Bev. It then cuts to the most honest moment from Pruitt. He says he brought the angel back with him to spread the miracle to the town, but it was really so he could have a second chance at a family with Mildred and Sarah, confirming that he is the father. A horrible tragedy fueled by love and regret, the Mike Flanagan way. She grew up and we faded away 
And that's how it's supposed to work. But it's all in Bev's hands now. So arrogant that she decides the fire that she set is the sign of revelation and they should burn down every home, leaving only the church and the rec center. Claiming that all the sinners will burn as the second death. But you see, I would have interpreted second death as them dying because like they already died once uh, and then when the sunshine hits, they're gonna ash right up. And the Flynn's fate ties back to how faith can change behavior and how people justify their actions. They tragically end up as vampires, but neither one of them succumbed to feeding. And Riley chose to die rather than commit the acts he knew would be expected for that eternal life. Whatever this is, don't change who you are. All those other people think that they're righteous and owed blood, that God willed it. Which is when Pruitt finally realizes the true level of horror he's unleashed as these monsters stumble towards him looking like zombies out of a Romero movie. It's never supposed to be about me. It's supposed to be about God. So Bev now has to find the scripture to make this delusion to continue working for her so she can condemn Pruitt, who was the one apparently gifted by God. Becoming the same false prophet that she claims to hate, literally choosing who's worthy of salvation. And just as Pruitt and Sarah are having their father-daughter moments, Sturge shoots her, and because she hasn't taken the sacrament and refuses to drink Pruitt's blood, she dies. Probably the best fate, but honestly, my Twilight and Underworld years uh, as an adolescent have tainted me, so I don't know if I would turn down being a vampire as long as I could bail on all the religious weirdos, you know? So they burn the church just as the sheriff is dousing the rec center with gas. And it's like the second they become vampires, the overt racism comes out. Hungry, huh? Dirty blood. Wow. It's so like, yeah, when you feel like you have that much power in your religion, you just stop making nice. But just as Aaron is about to light the place up, the angel descends, which really just makes Bev feel righteous till Ollie finishes the job. And now thanks to Bev, they have nowheres to hide from the sun. He makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. <laughs> God, she's hateful. They cast her so well. And while she's being drained, Aaron starts stabbing through the wings as much as she can. So as the sun rises, it can't fly to safety as fast anymore. And it may seem like it's setting up a sequel when Warren says he doesn't think it can make it to the mainland before sunrise. But Flanagan says this was more supposed to be like, you can't truly kill fanaticism. It'll always find a way to come back. It kind of seems like it did die because like right as the sun rises, Lisa can't feel her legs anymore, but it's probably just that the vampire blood worked its way out of her system. And it cuts back to Aaron in her mind as those last neurons are firing off, having a conversation with Riley about what happens in death again, except this time she has different answers. That there never was a her. She's who she is based on her choices and experiences. She began before the self was established and there's no point where the universe dies or begins. The death is just falling back into that cosmic ocean that no one ever really leaves because we're all built of the same atoms. And to her, God is that cosmos and all those different wishes of life. And I like the ideas presented here. I just hate the way this monologue was written. I feel like it pulls a lot of power out of the message because it just doesn't feel natural. Then everyone starts singing again and this time it's a hymn about accepting that death is just the stepping stone to God. Hassan and Ali pray one more time and Bev just desperately tries to burrow herself underground to escape this fate and perhaps escape that judgment that she's been so quick to dole out on everyone else. And it ends, an island on fire, singing cut short, with Warren and Lisa the only two survivors to tell this story of a seeming biblical wrath as the ashes float down around them. And that's the show. I think it did a really good job exploring the hypocrisy and how people wield religion as a weapon, how easy it is to warp scripture to match your needs and absolve you of wrongdoings, even if it's literally murder. And goddamn vampires! I just long for the five episode version of this show that's tightened up, you have all those ideas and the horror elements running on high. But that's just me, let me know what you guys are thinking. Either way, I am very excited to see what project he works on with Netflix next. But speaking of Netflix, do you ever run into an issue where people say they're watching something there, but then it's just not available where you live? Well, with today's sponsor, ExpressVPN, that is a problem no more. By connecting to their fast and secure server locations, ExpressVPN makes your internet think you're in a different location so you can take full advantage of region lock content. If there's a movie you're dying to watch and it's not available where you live, you just have to hop on over to unogs.com, look up anything you wanna see, and it'll tell you exactly which countries it's available in. Like say the religious stuff has you inspired and you wanna watch Primal Fear, just hop on Canadian Netflix and you're good to go. 
And it's not just for Netflix. I use it all the time with a variety of streaming services that aren't available where I live. Like right now, I've been using it with BBC iPlayer to watch a much more lighthearted vampire show, What We Do in the Shadows. ExpressVPN is super fast. I never run into any buffer issues and I use it across multiple devices with no issues. So if you wanna try ExpressVPN out for yourself and find out how you can get three months free, head on over to expressvpn.com slash Jedi or click the link in the description below. But that is gonna do it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, leave a like on the video. If you're into that kind of thing, I'll have all my other social medias linked down below if you want to follow me there. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay, and we'll catch you all later.